A few weeks after a young man started his new job, he was called into the boss's office. What's the meaning of this? The boss asked. When you applied for this job, you told us you had 10 years of experience. Now we discovered that this is the first job you've ever had in your entire life. Well, that's true, the young man answered, but in my defense, your advertisement stated that you were looking for someone with a good imagination. Now, I would suggest to you that that young man understood what is really going on when it comes to resumes and job applications. You try to figure out what the boss is looking for, and you do your best to give your boss what they're looking for. Now, ideally, you do this without lying. Let me ask you a question. What is God looking for? I mean, God's the ultimate boss. So as our ultimate boss, what is God looking for when it comes to his expectations for our lives? In a letter he wrote to the church in the city of Corinth, the Apostle Paul, one of the first leaders of the church, described a moment that every follower of Jesus is going to face in the future. It's the moment when every Christ follower's life is going to be examined. Now, since Jesus has cleansed us of our sins, a follower of Jesus is not going to be examined for the purpose of being condemned. No, our sins have been forgiven. But we'll be examined for the purpose of being rewarded. God will be looking to see what he can reward in our lives. So read with me how the Apostle Paul described the process. He said, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. Now pause here for a second. Paul here is talking about the, the church that he planted in Corinth. He started the church. He says, I started it. Someone else came and they built upon it. But now Paul's about to transition from talking about building churches to talking about living our lives. Keep reading. He says, but each one should, be, should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, the foundation of our eternal life is not our good deeds. It's what Jesus did on our behalf. Okay, but then what about afterwards? What, does it matter what you do for the rest of your life? If you're saved by what Jesus did for you, does that mean you can do nothing for the rest of your life? No, Jesus is our foundation, that a foundation no one else can lay other than Jesus. But then what about what we do for the rest of our lives? Paul likens that to what you build on that foundation. Keep reading. He says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, stop there for a second, he, he contrasts a quality of material, like quality of deeds. Gold, silver, costly stones, that's expensive stuff. Wood, hay, straw, stuff that kind of just burns. Which kind of deeds does your life exhibit, he's saying? Valuable deeds or worthless deeds? Keep reading. He says, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day, capital D, meaning the day of judgment, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, he says that the builder will suffer loss, yet they themselves will be saved. They'll suffer loss, but they'll be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flame. So you'll be saved by the skin of your teeth, as we would say in English. Now, here's the thing. When you stand before God at that moment, what do you think God's going to be looking for? As far as you understand things, what kind of a life will get rewarded by God on that day? What kind of a life is going to get a thumbs up from God? Now, you need to know, for the first 40 years of my life, I completely messed up the answer to this question. You need to know, for the first 40 years of my life, what I thought God was looking for and what I later discovered God is actually looking for are two completely different things. I tell you this because it's possible that the lie I was believing for many years is the same lie that many of you are believing right now. And it's my goal for the next 15 minutes to expose the lie and unveil the truth. And it's my hope that through this exposing and through this unveiling, lives are going to be set free. About 20 years ago, God revealed to me what he saw when he looked into my heart. And what God revealed to me wasn't pretty. God revealed to me a heart that was filled and fueled with selfish ambition. 
God revealed to me that deep within me was a drive to be seen and to be known as successful. And God revealed to me that this inner drive started when I was just a young boy. Now, for reasons that I won't get into today, from an early age, I believed the lie that I was somehow inferior, that my value was somehow less than the value of those around me. And believing this lie drove me to feel that I had to continually prove my worth, that I had to continually validate my existence. And that subconscious lie became the subconscious script and subconscious motivation for much of my life. I was believing the lie that I had to be somebody. The lie that in order to be lovable, I had to be memorable. The lie that in order to make a difference, I had to make a mark. The lie that in order to get God's approval, I had to get the world's attention. So I did my best to be somebody. I did my best to somehow achieve greatness. You know, when you're young, this actually seems realistic. When you're young, this seems quite plausible and quite doable. When you're young, you think you have a long runway ahead of you. You think you have the time to accelerate your career and launch your life to make your mark. And then one day you come to a realization. You realize that the runway behind you has gotten a lot longer and the runway ahead of you is getting a lot shorter. And so like a pilot, you do the math and you do the calculations and you realize the chances of your life taking off in the limited space you have left are pretty slim. So you begin to doubt that your hopes of greatness are ever gonna become reality. You begin to fear that your life is a failure, and you begin to wonder what God thinks of you, and this sense of sadness begins to descend upon your life. So you buy a Corvette. <laughs> Does any of this sound vaguely familiar? Do you know what it feels like to be driven by the need to achieve? Do you find yourself believing that God is expecting you to do great things with your life? Do you secretly believe that anything less than a phenomenal life is a failed life? Is this kind of thinking even biblical? It was Abraham Lincoln who once said, God must love the common man because he made so many of them. Let's face it. We all live the vast majority of our lives under the radar. Meaning, we spend the largest part of our lives in ordinary places doing ordinary things with ordinary people. We spend most of our days going to school, driving to and from work, mowing the lawn, washing the dishes, walking the dog, changing the diapers, tidying the house, making the meals. We spend most of our days doing the chores necessary to simply maintain an ordinary life. We spend most of our time as ordinary people, with ordinary people, doing ordinary things. But somehow, we've gotten it into our minds that God is expecting us to be extraordinary. Somehow, we've gotten it into our brains that God only loves and rewards the big dogs of our world. Somehow, we've gotten it into our minds that God expects us to live loud lives. What if I were to tell you that God's Word tells us the exact opposite? What if I were to tell you that God's Word does not tell us to live loud lives, but God's Word tells us to live quiet lives? Would that surprise you? Writing to the church in Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul gave them this advice. He says, Now about your love for one another. We don't need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, he says, you do all of, all of God's family throughout Macedonia. So, so you're doing all that. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And to make it, now look at this, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. To lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's inspired advice in this God-breathed document was this. The life's ambition for a follower of Jesus should be to live a quiet life. 
Wow. Now, hold on, someone's out there and you're saying, what about the life of Jesus? Come on, Darren, isn't Jesus supposed to be our example? Jesus traveled all over the place. Jesus was a miracle worker. Jesus had crowds of people following him everywhere he went. How is that living a quiet life? Yes, Jesus did do those things and even more. But that was only a small sliver of Jesus' life. Do you realize that Jesus' public ministry accounted for only three of the 33 years of his life on earth? Sure, we have entire books in the Bible that detail the incredible events that took place during those three years, but what about the other 30 years? What happened during the other three decades of Jesus' life? Now, we don't have a lot of information, but we do have enough snippets to fill the gaps. For example, we know the events around Jesus' birth, but then we don't hear anything about his life until he turns 12. And we learn at that point that he was submitting to the authority of his mother and father at the age 12, and he was growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, Scripture says. The next time we meet up with Jesus after he's 12, he's 30 years old, and he's beginning his public ministry. So what happened during the 18 years between the age 12 and the age 30? What kind of a life did Jesus live during that period? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. Jesus lived an ordinary life. He lived a quiet life. He earned the respect of those around him, and he worked with his hands so that his family would not be dependent on others. How do we know this? We know this because Matthew and Mark tell us. Describing the beginning of his public ministry, Matthew tells us what happened the first time Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth. Look what it says. It says, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogues, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Now, look at the reaction of the people that Jesus grew up with. They were shocked at what they were hearing and seeing. So evidently, up until then, Jesus clearly was not known for his teaching and his miracles. So what was Jesus known for in his hometown? Keep reading the next verse. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get these things? What was Jesus known for in his hometown? Jesus was known for his family, and he was known for his father's profession. But Mark tells us that Jesus was more than the son of a carpenter. Mark tells us that Jesus followed in his father's footsteps. Mark writes, where did this man get these things? They asked, what's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? See, Jesus wasn't just known for being the son of a carpenter. Jesus was known for being a carpenter himself. By the way, the Greek word, which this was written in Greek, which was translated carpenter in English, is tekton. It was the word for someone skilled with their hands and working particularly with wood or stone. It was the word used to describe a craftsman, a contractor, a handyman. Now, Christian tradition over the centuries has long taught that Jesus' father, Joseph, died while Jesus was young, forcing Jesus, as the eldest son, to work in order to support his mother and the younger members of the family so they wouldn't have to depend on anyone else. Interestingly, historians tell us that during Jesus' lifetime, Herod commissioned the building of a city named Sepphoris. Herod wanted the city to impress Caesar and to be the pride of all the Galilee. So a lot of money and a lot of work was poured into the building of the city of Sepphoris. Interestingly, Sepphoris was about a two-hour walk from Nazareth. So scholars believe that Joseph and Jesus very likely did a lot of work there in that town. So in other words, Jesus had plenty of work to keep him busy, be it in Nazareth or Sepphoris. So what have we learned? so far about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Well, we've learned that Jesus was not known for his teaching. He was not known for his wisdom. He was not known for being a worker of miracles. He was not known for any of those things. 
Jesus was known to be an ordinary man living way up north in Nazareth, a backwater village that was full of hicks and country bumpkins. Understand this. Jesus spending the first 30 years of his life in Nazareth would be like someone spending the first 30 years of their life in Spuzzum. Nazareth was not the kind of place you lived when you were trying to make a mark in this world. When one guy in the big city of Jerusalem was told that Jesus was the Messiah and he was from Nazareth, the guy's first response was, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? But that was Jesus' home, and that was Jesus' life. For 30 years, Jesus lived an ordinary, quiet life in an ordinary, quiet village, quietly working with his ordinary hands at an ordinary, quiet job, providing for his ordinary, quiet family. Which leads us back to the question we began with today. What kind of a life does God expect? What kind of a life does God reward? Well, what was God's opinion of the first 30 years of Jesus' life? What did God think of the ordinary, quiet life that Jesus was leading? We don't have to wonder. We've been given the answer to that question. The Heavenly Father Himself gave us the answer when He gave us His opinion out loud for everyone to hear. It took place at the Jordan River, the day that Jesus began His public ministry at His baptism. The Gospel of Mark records what took place. It says this, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. You're my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now think about this. This is before Jesus overcame the devil's temptation in the wilderness. This is before Jesus had called a single disciple. This is before Jesus had preached a single sermon. This is before Jesus had told a single parable. This is before Jesus had performed a single miracle. Gethsemane and Calvary and the empty tomb, all in the future. None of that had yet taken place. Nonetheless, the father looked at the carpenter named Jesus and said, With you, I am well pleased. Well, why was God so pleased? With what was God so pleased? God the Father was pleased with the way that Jesus had lived his ordinary, quiet life. God the Father was pleased with the way that Jesus quietly honored his parents. God the Father was pleased with the way that Jesus quietly went to work every morning, quietly did his best with the skills that he had, and then quietly returned home to his family every evening. God the Father was pleased with the way that Jesus quietly and faithfully attended the synagogue and participated in the life of the Jewish community in Nazareth. God the Father was pleased with the way that Jesus quietly loved and served those around him. God the Father was pleased with the way that Jesus had quietly lived his ordinary life in a backwater village in northern Israel. And I would suggest to you that God's voice of affirmation for the ordinary life of Jesus puts God's stamp of approval upon the life of every ordinary follower of Jesus today. So why does all this matter? I mean, why are we even talking about this today? Many a time over the years, I found myself driving in a car or riding on a train looking out the window, or I found myself staring out the window of a plane, seeing some tiny home beneath me in some remote village and some forgotten part of the world that I'm flying over, and I've wondered to myself, who lives there? I mean, what does God have for them? What does God expect of them? Today, we're being reminded of the value and the power of the simple, quiet life. Today, we're being reminded to honor and celebrate the carpenters of our world. So often, we focus upon those on the platform, those in the spotlight, falsely believing that their calling has a greater value or a greater reward than other callings. This is not true. There are all kinds of callings 
There are all kinds of ways to serve God. There are all kinds of ways to please God. Yes, we continue to pray that God will call men and women to dedicate their lives to full-time service as pastors and teachers and global workers. We thank God for such people, but not everyone has such a mandate. And we should not be comparing ourselves with those who do. To our own master, we will stand or fall, the Apostle Paul once said. I often think of the story of the rabbi who was on his deathbed. And as he was about to breathe his last, someone leaned into him as he was having that final breath. And they asked him, Rabbi, what are you thankful for at this moment as you're about to die? And the rabbi, with his final words, responded and said, I'm thankful that God will not ask me why I wasn't Moses. Different lives have different callings. Different lives have different roles. You just need to live your calling. You just need to live your role. God is not comparing you to anyone else. God is not going to ask why you weren't Moses. God is not expecting you to be anyone other than yourself. And this brings us to today's big idea where we sum up the teaching. Here it is. God is not calling us to reach for greatness. God is calling us to reflect his image. God's not calling us to reach for greatness. God is calling us to reflect his image. You know, many years ago now, when I held my first grandson in my hands, I looked down at him, and looking at his face, a thought passed into my heart and mind. The thought came, your children will have no idea who I am. It occurred to me, I will be the great grandfather of your children, and they will have no idea who I am. I will have passed off the scene long before they came into existence. I don't know my great grandparents. I don't know their names, don't know anything about them. I looked at my grandson's eyes and I thought, your children will have no idea who I am. And I came to the conclusion that I'm okay with that. I came to the conclusion that God is not calling me to reach for greatness. God is calling me to reflect his image. I came to the conclusion that my great-grandchildren won't realize it, but if I faithfully play my role, my quiet life of reflecting God's image will have faithfully influenced the lives of those who faithfully influenced them. And if I live this way, and if you live this way, and if we make this our life's ambition, we will hear the same words that were spoken to that carpenter from the tiny village of Nazareth. With you, I am well pleased. Thank you, Pastor Darren, for sharing with us. Listen, if you're beginning your journey with Jesus, or maybe you've started the journey and you're not clear about what the next steps would be in that journey, just head to our website, click on the Start Here button, and see the resources because they are there for you. Well, for this week, there are no reflection questions as we usually have, but I wanna thank you for joining us and I wanna wish you a really great week.